Thank you. All right. So let me dive in. Um, many of you actually in the audience are actually our clients, right? So Serious Decisions is a uh, B2B research and advisory firm. What does that mean? I'm essentially a non-credentialed therapist, right? I am one of uh, the group directors, so I run Serious Decisions' largest service. We have 12 role-based services. I run our demand creation strategy service. Those role-based services go across marketing, uh, product, um, and sales. And I have 12 analysts on my team who are all first-time analysts. So what does that mean? That means we are all practitioners. Across our group, 180 years of marketing experience in demand creation roles, half of those at management or leadership levels. So I am a non-credential therapist. I understand your problems. I have lived them. I spend my whole day talking to companies about the challenges they have and how to overcome them. And a lot of times that starts by helping them ask the right questions in the first place. So what are we gonna talk about today? You know, the theme of my presentation is really around new nurture techniques. And this is a very exciting time for B2B marketers. There are a lot of challenges, and with challenges comes opportunity. Right? So I think everyone in the, room in the room probably realizes that cost is always a consideration for B2B marketers. I will tell you, we have over 500 clients in my service alone, and I've only run into one who complained to me that they had too much budget to spend. It's usually the other way around. So cost and the cost of generating net new demand is always higher than making what you have actually more efficient and productive for you. Reach is another big concern. Not only do we have regulatory issues in different markets, but we also have declining response rates. So it can get really difficult to reach your target audience. And then effectiveness. We have so much information, so much content, so many channels. How do we actually make our outreach to the prospective buyers really effective. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, I want to start by talking about some recent research that we have done. You know, serious decisions. I spend a lot of my time on the phone with clients, but we also conduct research, both in the form of primary research through surveys. We also do multi-client studies. Now, we just recently completed a very, very big study that I think is one of the first of its kind, where we went out and did a survey around B2B buying. We went out and surveyed over 1,000 B2B decision makers uh, that were making technology purchases. And we're not talking about a buying study around what are their preferences, but what are their actual behaviors. So what we did is when we talked to, when we surveyed these 1,000 people, you know, we had um, a representation, about 70% North America, 30% Europe. It was across five de re different revenue bands, so companies as small as under 50 million. The largest band was over $3 billion, represented 12 different industries, and 85% of those participants in this study had actually been involved in a significant technology purchase within the last 90 days. Right? And they identified themselves slightly over half as decision makers, and the remainder were influencers. So a pretty robust study that we did around what are those key buying behaviors. So I'm going to share with you a few of the data points from that because I think it's really important. When we talk about nurture, it's not about what we do. It's about who we are trying to target and what behaviors are we trying to influence so that ultimately we create demand for our solutions. So one of these key data points that we looked at, we looked at buying interactions. We looked at their behaviors. And in this study, we defined a buying interaction as an exchange of information between the buyer and the provider. And one of the things that we found is we looked at the types of behaviors, and we looked at those that occurred in a self-guided capacity. We also looked at those that happened in a live environment through a human interaction. And we saw a couple of things that are somewhat obvious. As your interaction volume will certainly increase, as your price point increases, you will see at low expenditure levels that these non-human interactions occur more frequently. And then certainly as you go beyond these, these high, at the higher expenditure levels, you're going to actually see more human interactions. And you see that inflection point is right around $1,800. So we looked at not only you know, these individuals, but we actually looked at the types of purchases they were looking at. And one of the interesting data points here is when we looked at those 1,000 participants, we looked at the purchases that they were answering the questions against. You know, A full 41% of those are what we would consider uh, independent, or they're more transactional, simple types of transactions where they could actually do this with input from just one or two people. Um, another set was really looking at 
um, at the other extreme, kind of these, uh, or in the middle, there's consensus types of transactions, which tended to be more team-based and consensus-driven. There might be a few evaluators. And that was about uh, another 40%. And then the last 19% was actually what we would consider committee-type purchases, which are multi-tiered, very complex types of transactions. So across all of that set, we see these types of interactions. And I think the really compelling point about this one is that you actually see that even at that low end, where the purchase price is really low, there's actually a significant, it's, it's interesting how close those lines are between um, human and self-guided types of interactions. So let me talk about this a little bit more because you're gonna be asking, what are those behaviors? What were you looking for? And I think it's important to really look at the types of behaviors that go into a buying process are varied, right? So we tried to categorize those into logical you know, representation. And the way we did this is a by a two by two axis. And we looked at what we call conduit, which is kind of a way to categorize the delivery mechanism for this information exchange. And we do that in terms of non-human and human. But we also looked at what we call reciprocity. So this is the idea, is how much responsiveness is there in that type of interaction. So when we look at those non-human, we break that into kind of two quadrants. The first one is facilitated. So this is where you are essentially making that information available for passive consumption, primarily through an online channel. Simulated is also available. You know, information is available in that online environment, but it's in, an, in, in a situation where you get some res responsiveness from your buyer because you are controlling that type of environment. So thinking about a free trial might be an example of that, whereas a facilitated one might be, for example, exploring websites or exploring a social community or, or a LinkedIn might be an example of a facilitated. Now, when we look at the human interactions, we think about that around those same dimensions. So the ones on influenced, these are live interactions, but they're typically done through a third party. So the level of reciprocity is relatively low, whereas orchestrated types of interactions are ones that are live and usually with a representative of the provider, okay? So when we looked at this survey, we actually were looking for you know, these types of behaviors and what type of impact they actually had on the buying process. Are you interested in knowing how they turned out? Okay. <laughs> so one of the things we did is we looked at across all of these different ones, and what I'm highlighting to you are the five that scored the highest, okay? And what you will see, there's only five, and those five had a very limited impact on the decision-making process on their own. So these five are the only five that scored at 0.1 or higher. Not a single one scored 0.2 or higher. So when I said I was a therapist and I helped clients ask the right question, I will tell you a question a lot of them will come to me particularly around the campaigns run and the nurture programs they do, is what works. And what they want to know is what tactic, you know, what delivery mechanism, and they're just saying what works as if there's a singular answer. And what this shows is there is no singular answer. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of different interactions that occur. Now what this doesn't show, but what we have, is how does that story change if you're asking about, okay, well what I want to know is what really works for a key persona and a key stage of the buying process, the numbers actually change quite dramatically. So what that reinforces is if you have really good segmentation and targeting about who you're going after for what reason, you're gonna see a very different story as opposed to a one single bullet, you know, one single solution to that. So the other thing I wanna highlight is we also ask, well, how many actually interactions are prevalent in these types of purchase transactions? And the numbers are a little bit surpri surprising. So if you look across those different purchase transaction types, independent consensus and committee, where they get more complex at a higher price point, you will actually see a fairly good mix of both human and non-human interactions across all three of those. Of course, when you're looking at consensus and committee, we're not talking about a single individual, but multiple individuals, so it multiplies, all right? So you're really looking at quite a fair bit of complexity in a B2B buying process. Not to mention, it tends not to be linear or phased, it tends to be episodic behavior. So how do you make sense of all of this? That is the key question. And I think what the key takeaway is in this is you have to have really good intelligence around the target audience and what you're trying to do with that target audience and really design that experience into an integrated program. So let's talk about that because I wanna bring some of these buying interactions and the results of that study back to this core element of nurture. 
Now, I will be the first to admit that as a marketer, when I first started with Nurture, I fell into the camp of a one-size-fits-all. If I had somebody in my database who had an email address, I put them into my marketing automation platform and they got email on a periodic basis, right? We have evolved from there quite a bit and we have a lot more capability available to us to make our nurture programs, to Russ's point, a lot more relevant, right? So I'm gonna talk to you about that and what we do is there's so many possible permutations, it becomes a question of how do I break this down in a logical way so that I can plan my nurture programs effectively. And we start by defining different types of nurture. And the way to do this is by looking at your waterfall or your demand funnel. And this is kind of a representation of all the sales and marketing activities and what do you need to do to actually take a lead and progress that lead so it converts ultimately to close one business. So Serious Decisions defines four different types of nurture programs against that waterfall. So you'll see what we call a pre-MQL you know, nurture program is really something that happens at the, towards the top of the waterfall where you're taking somebody that you've captured through an acquisition program and you're trying to nurture their interest, their demand for your solution. That's what most marketers associate nurture with and perhaps more importantly, what sales typically associates nurture to. But there's other areas, right? There's what we call recycled and I think this is a great opportunity for a lot of marketers because even the best companies and we benchmark their conversion rates through the waterfall year in, year out, there, is always, there will always be leads that fall out of the funnel, even for very good reasons. The question becomes is how do you treat those leads? How do you recycle that demand? So when we talk about these types of recycle nurture programs, we have them in terms of active and passive. Active is where you are basically trying to recycle them in a nurture program based on a disqualification reason, Whereas passive is the idea that you're not gonna let a lead sit dormant for an extended period of time. You're gonna use a time-based trigger to try to recycle and nurture that lead. And the last one is reconstituted. And these are the ones that fall out at the bottom of the funnel. They don't buy, maybe they were an opportunity at one point, maybe they lost funding for a project. By one reason or another, they died on the vine. Nobody's calling on them, you're not marketing to them. How do you try to reactivate that demand periodically? So those are the four types of nurture against the waterfall. And what's really important when you think about nurture is defining the goals around it. So you'll see I highlighted the four, but I'm also looking at particularly today where we have so much more technology and insight available, nurture discipline is extending beyond that waterfall. So you see at the front end, we can now have capabilities with tools like LinkedIn and other new technologies to actually nurture across different channels, even unknown prospects that we don't know by name, right? When the goal there is to actually capture that person as a lead. Pre-MQL is about qualify, you know, recycled is really about trying to requalify by either the disqualification or the reason or a certain behavior. Reconstitute is where you're trying to restore that opportunity. And then long term, you know, this is where you have nurture programs where these are actually outside the waterfall. The waterfall is meant to represent leads that are active in some type of evaluation. Well, what about the dormant leads? What do you do with them? And this doesn't even get into customer nurture or you know, where things like in product nurture might come in. So there are a lot of different ways to frame a nurture strategy, but each one of these has to be driven by a specific goal. Now, when we look at that way and you think about your nurture strategy rel relative to where it is in the waterfall and the goal you're trying to achieve, you really wanna think about what are the pillars. So this is a strategic directive. And when you think about a good nurture program, think about it this way. All right, well, I'm gonna design a program. It is targeted at this stage of the waterfall. How does somebody get into it? What are the entry criteria? Is it dr driven by behaviors? Is it by a segmentation rule? Given that they enter that nurture program, what am I gonna do with those individuals? How do I treat them? How am I going to use this nurture program to qualify their interests or potentially reactivate their interests? How do I know that they've moved into an active evaluation state? What's that transition signal? Is it based on a lead score? Is it certain action that they take? And then where am I actually going to deliver that to lead when I pick up on that signal? Does it go, does it go to a sales rep? Does it go to a telequal team? Does it go to another nurture program that might be more specific based on context you pick up in the course of the nurture? So these are the pillars of what we call a complete nurture. So you have the four, primary types, you have these different pillars, but in today's day and age where we have so many channels available to us and so much information, I will tell you the biggest flaw that I see in nurture is that companies are basically putting out and they're focused very much on broad-based content that will attract a lot of interest and drive a lot of response, 
but won't necessarily progress somebody in the buying cycle. So what they're effectively doing is using nurturing programs to actually create demand for their content, but not necessarily for their solutions. So when you think about this nurture treatment, you know, in those four pillars, you really got to zero in on that critical treatment pillar. And what we have defined here is really identifying, well, what's the context for that nurture, which is also, you know, who's in it, what's the type of nurture, how did they get into the program, but what do you actually know about that individual? What do you know about his company? What do you know about things that are going on in his industry? Today, when we have so much more information available to us, not only inside of our marketing automation platforms, but external to it, I mean, imagine if you could identify at a personal level you know, key individuals in these nurture programs and had, for example, some of the information that was showcased over here around the skill sets of those individuals as captured on LinkedIn. That's a heck of a lot of really powerful context that would really then inform you know, what types of messages and offers you deliver. And if you have this in your database in a normalized way, this allows you to map that context, that intelligence against content, offers, the personas, so that you have a dynamic environment where you are really mixing and matching the individual against their specific need, perhaps for a phase of the buying cycle, against your goal in the nurture program with content that you have normalized against it. It becomes a fantastic mechanism where it's a lot of if-then, if-then type of analysis that you're hopefully doing in some type of dynamic way. That then gets into intensity. How frequently are you actually delivering these messages? You know, and that's going to be based on what makes sense for you from a cost-benefit analysis, but also the preferences of the recipient. And then ultimately, which nurture channels or delivery mechanisms are you utilizing for this nurture flow? There are so many options to us available today that were not even available five, ten years ago that it can become overwhelming for the marketer to figure out. So I've highlighted here those four key pillars of nurture, and then I'm talking about in specific some of the elements of treatment. Where does this come into play? Right? If you're trying to evolve from a situation where it's kind of one and done, one size fits all, to one where you're being a lot more specific, this becomes a framework where you're basically putting out a request process. Our clients use these frameworks to define questions that requesters of a nurture program would have to answer so that you can get more specific about what it is you're delivering. So, a little bit overwhelming it might seem at first, but this is a great opportunity, and I'm gonna share with you some of the data that we have from a study that we did last year around nurture, right? So what we found is that yes, there has not necessarily been a revolution in nurture, but certainly in evolution. There are a lot of companies out there that still do email only, one size fits all nurture. But we found in our study last year that on average, companies have 5.3 unique pre-MQL tracks. We see that one out of three nurture programs are actually targeted to existing customers versus net new prospects. We see utilization of nurture technology for what we call small net phishing, which is actually an outbound nurture program that combines email with outbound calling, very small percentage. And we do see a lot of companies that are admitting that they are trying to figure out how to do recycle, which a lot of times requires a very strong commitment and alignment with the sales team to do it, but they're having some challenges. We also see in terms of how these tactics are evolving, there are, you know, how is nurture being enhanced? So we have almost a quarter of companies reported that they are actually injecting telephone into their nurture flows. Another 16% were actually incorporating display advertising, particularly around retargeting. Some are even experimenting with integrating chat into their nurture flows. And a lot of them are actually saying a big part of that nurture experience is actually the experience on the website. And they are trying to conversion and optimize those sites based on the persona. Right? And if you look at the nurture design, you see that instead of one size fits all, we see a lot more segmentation of these nurture flows in terms of by topic, by industry, by buying stage. And what we consider best in class is where you're doing a lot of this by persona, assuming you have some real depth to what the persona represents. So hopefully what this comes down to and the key point that I want to make is you have, are at a great opportunity to like never before, use the technology that's available to us, and I think just as importantly, the intelligence and the insights around our target audiences to think about moving beyond scaling this just in terms of volume, right? When I started out, first time I did Nurture, I developed it, I thought it was a fantastic mechanism to make the company that I ran as I ran the marketing department was a relatively small company. It made us appear much larger because we were able to each a relatively broad audience. But what you have available to you today in terms of the technologies, the insights, and the integration points between them 
which is incredible, is where you are able to actually achieve a different kind of scale. And this is one around precision. It's around specificity. It's around matching the capabilities you have with what are those types of experiences that are hopefully going to progress those leads to become actually paying customers. This is about relevance. It's around predictability. So this is the opportunity that we as marketers have. All right. So the third part that I wanted to talk about was what is the process that you can go through to actually evaluate the different channels to support your nurture programs. There are so many different channels today where you can tie these experiences together utilizing the technology you have and if you have really good insight around who you're targeting and you've defined where you think the best nurturers are going to work in terms of the goals that you're trying to achieve from demand creation, how do you actually evaluate the different channels of delivery mechanisms against one another? Because just because you could actually send communications through every one of these delivery mechanisms doesn't mean that you actually should. So one of the ways that we advise clients to do this is really to evaluate these delivery mechanisms relative to one another. Think about them in terms of evaluating them against some of these internal factors. If you were to look across tele, around display, around email, around direct mail, potentially making some investments where you can have a personalized experience based on that persona on the website, all of these can be tied into very specific nurture flows. But does it necessarily make sense? Right? There's so many permutations that you have to do some type of trade-off analysis to determine which ones are going to actually help you achieve your goal. This really comes back to one of the big challenges we hear about nurture. You know, a lot of marketers will say it makes a lot of sense. I buy into it. I want to do it. But what they really struggle with is determining, well, what's the value of doing it? How do I prove it's actually working? And this is where we start getting into you know, really trying to evaluate. If you think about it, right? any one of the stages in the waterfall, if you have a volume of leads in that and you know your historical conversion rates, you can determine a projected value of those leads, the expected value of those leads based on those conversion rates. So if you're thinking about a recycle nurture and you're targeting a middle stage, maybe a sales accepted lead, you know, that's going to have a very different expected value than something that might be at the top of the waterfall. But really looking at the goals for your nurture, the volumes that are in there, you know, the budget that you have available, what's the expected output from that, those are all critical. But you also have to look at, well, what are some of the data governance issues that you might be running into for that type of nurture or that delivery channel, some of the requirements. And most importantly, looking at some of the skills and expertise. Do you actually have that in place to support developing a nurture program that will be delivered in part through that channel? Do you have the tracking and measurement systems in place to support it? Just as importantly, you got to evaluate this against your target audience and what are their expectations. This is critically important, right? You know, I can tell you from doing, you know, benchmark analysis with our clients, when you come up with a single waterfall and you say, this is kind of the conversion through it, and you might report that up, and it might not be where you want it to be. One of the first questions I'll ask a client, well, if you look at the top of the waterfall and all the inquiries that you're generating, all those initial leads, those responders, how many of them are in profile for who you can actually sell your product to, right? So you have to have start from a standpoint of your goal has to be defined around the target audience that you're trying to attract, qualify, convert, into paying customers. So understanding who that target is, is and who are the personas within it, what are their preferences, where do they go, what activity and behaviors do they exhibit, that's where you can use some of the insights we have from the buyer interaction study. You know, understanding that buying cycle stage and what are those knowledge inflection points, those are all absolutely critical determinants. And there's, you know, there are some clients out there I have that you know, a big part of their strategy for nurture is mobile because that's what they've determined their key target audiences are communicating through. But I also know from my previous experience, I wanted to do mobile, but I was selling to a procurement audience. And I gotta tell you, they were not high adopters in terms of communicating and using mobile in any type of way where I could use it effectively for nurture. So that has to inform your decision in terms of which channels you're gonna use to support these nurture flows. Okay, so at this point, Hopefully, I gave you some insights in terms of thinking about buying interactions and that exchange of information between buyer and seller and how that is reinforcing a need for not focusing on the silver bullet, but really understanding that 
the way buying transactions occur involves a lot of human and non-human interaction that you really need to understand at that persona level, at that buying phase level. Hopefully I gave to you at a very high level very quickly an introduction to the Serious Decisions Nurture Framework, which really does allow you to frame how do you actually design these nurture programs in terms of you know, how does somebody get into it? You know, which nurture program are they going into? What is my goal for it? How do they get into it? How do I treat them? How do I know that they're ready to come out of it? And where does it go, right? And then we also focused on you know, looking at how to you know, really identify some of those key nurture channels. And instead of looking at this as well, I'm gonna do everything. You have to be a lot smarter because investments, the funds that most marketers have, and maybe that one company is in the room, I don't know, but most say no, they have limited funds. So you gotta make smart use of those dollars. And it's really around aligning those nurture programs to the goals, those audience appropriate treatment plans, and then really thinking about it the way that Alyssa talked about before. This is an age where it's really about the art of the possible, right? We as marketers are not limited by the technology or the intelligence that we have. There are so many service providers out there that can take your database, that can cleanse it, can normalize it. You can integrate from other systems and other information providers. You have the raw tools that you need. What you need to then do next, though, is say, how do I organize this so that I can achieve scale through precision? It's around being specific to the needs of that target audience. And like Russ talked about, the ultimate goal is to achieve that true one-to-one -one marketing so that you are delivering the right message at the right time to affect the right goal. So it's a win not only for your buyer, but also for you so that you can go back to management and show Here's how this nurture program actually affected and contributed to the pipeline that we had to contribute this quarter, next quarter for the year. All right. So with that, I thank you for your time. I'll be here at the cocktail hour to answer any questions. Thank you.